Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. Coming up this... <music> Starting off the news this week, some pretty big news actually. The UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, has published an extensive new study on the impact of global temperatures reaching 1.5 degrees C above their pre-industrial levels. Extensive doesn't really cover it, but one of the major things that it factors in, which hasn't really been done before, because it hadn't happened yet, is the renewed global response to climate change, developments that have been happening over the last few years. When looking at the future, or indeed possible futures, it takes several different emission scenarios into account and looks at what could happen with each one. Unfortunately, the report finds that with all these scenarios, global temperatures will reach above 1.5 degrees C in comparison with their 1850 to 1900 levels. This would mean that it's very likely that the Arctic will be almost completely ice-free in the month of September at least once before the midpoint of the century. The last time such a report of this scale was published was in 2013. It comes at a very opportune time, as the COP26 Climate Summit convenes this November in Glasgow. There's obviously a lot I'd like to talk about in this report, but don't have time to here in 7 Days of Science. So as always, the report will be linked below, but the BBC News article compiles a lot of the information pretty well, with some easy to read graphics too, if you're tight on time. In other news, the tallest space rocket ever briefly existed on Saturday as SpaceX's SN20 Starship and Super Heavy rocket prototype was assembled and then disassembled. The upper stage, of which prototypes have already been tested, was placed on top of the first functional Super Heavy booster, which had already been moved to the launch pad at a SpaceX facility in Texas, USA. This is the first Starship prototype that will go to space, which is why it is also the first to have its heat shield plating fitted. Despite this being the biggest rocket ever assembled, both of these two stages will, in future iterations at least, be fully reusable. The test flight for this prototype unfortunately won't be for a while though, at least a few weeks and maybe longer. And now over to Ben, with some news about some things that have some very long and difficult to pronounce names. Thanks, Doc. Well, up next in the news is the exciting description of a new dromaeosaurid species, the very first one to be discovered in Brazil. Named Ipupiara lopi, I think I'm very sorry for the pronunciation, the material this new dinosaur was based on was tragically lost during the fire that swept through the National Museum of Brazil back in 2018. Photographs of the fossils were fortunately taken though, and so there is still a record of this dinosaur's remains. Ipupiaria was found to belong to the potential dromaeosaurid subgroup Unenlargianae, again, sorry if that's pronounced wrong, based on various characters of its teeth. Examinations of the teeth also led the researchers to conclude that fish would have been a major part of the diet of this dinosaur. Ipupiaria is found to be the sister taxon to Ostroraptor, and the discovery sheds new light on the evolution of Gondwanan dromaeosaurs, so a very exciting paper indeed. And finally for this week, we have a paper naming a new species of pterosaur, which is always nice to see. Remarkably though, this pterosaur was actually discovered in Australia, despite Australian pterosaurs being very rarely found. The paper explains how since the first pterosaur was found in Australia 40 years ago, fewer than 20 specimens have been described since, so this is an important discovery. Additionally, this new species, named Thapangaka shawi, is the largest pterosaur so far found in the country. Only the end of a mandible is known for this animal, but it displays many features similar to the Anhanguaridae family of pterosaurs, except this animal has the largest mandibular crest of any. It seems that this family actually experienced a significant evolutionary radiation when they reached Australia, with all Australian Anhanguarids being closely related. So another fascinating discovery, we've had some great news this week. Back to Doug in the studio. Thank you Ben. Well, that's it. See ya.